Testament this morning, the Old Testament. We're going to be in the book of 1 Chronicles. So if you will stand, if you will stand as the offer the honor of the reading of the Word of God, I ask you to turn to 1 Chronicles in chapter 29 this morning. Chapter 29 is where we are going to be. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. When we all get there, we'll start our reading and we'll go headlong here today. Open and pray and the Lord will bless us in a tremendous way in our Sunday morning service hour, Sunday morning worship hour here. Uh, we want to be true to the Lord's Word. We want to continue to honor Him in every step that we make. And do ask today that the Lord will richly and wonderfully bless uh, the words that are read uh, from His Word into our hearts and into our minds. First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 29, and in verse 16, probably one of the, uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, prayers I think you'll find in the Word of God, or, or one, of the most, one of the dearest prayers inside the Word of God. And uh, so I want, to, I want you to read this with me, if you will, beginning in verse 16. The Bible says, O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in a house for thy holy name cometh to thine hand, and is all thine own. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and have pleasure, has pleasure in the uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I, will, I have willingly offered all these things. And now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers keep this forever in the imagination of the faults of the hearts of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. And give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart, to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and do all these things, and to build this the palace for the which I have made. Provision. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the wonderful day. We thank you for the time again to be here together. We ask you to take your holy word this morning and apply it into our hearts, dear God. I pray as we see this request uh, that the king makes unto you to, to give his son, Solomon, a perfect heart. Help us look at this point this morning. Help us look at this aspect. Help us look at this prayer and this plea as, as David had prepared uh, provisional wise the, the building of the temple. Lord, we ask you this morning to please dwell with us in the midst. Continue to watch over us. Give us guidance, grace, and mercy. And we give you honor and glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. And please be seated. One of my thoughts during the devotion time this week was out of this passage of Scripture. Primarily looking in verses, uh, verse 19. Where David the king had made this prayer on the backside of this uh, continual prayer for the people and the preparation of the building of the temple that he was not going to be allowed to make. And he asked, he says, and given to my and given to Solomon, my son, he says, a perfect heart. Why did he want him to have a perfect heart? Well, it's to keep the commandments of God. To keep the commandments, to keep the testimonies and thy statutes, do all these things, and to build the palace for which I have made provision. You know, here's where I am with this this week. And I think of myself, I have four children, I'm a parent. Most in here are parents. And as Christian parents, we try to do the best that we can to prepare our children uh, for the lives that they will eventually leave on, but lead on their own. Uh, David understood that all the provision that he had provided for Solomon, everything that he had built up for him, everything that he had taught him and trained him and, and led him and guided him and directed him, eventually he was going to have to do it on his own. Uh, we work hard today to provide the necessities of life in our home. We understand that. We provide our children with things like a shelter and food and clothing as, as until they go out into the world. Our role is to teach them life skills and to give them responsibilities as they grow in order to train them for the challenges that they are going to face in life. Every one of them are going to face them. But all of this would not matter much. All of the teaching, all of the training, the washing clothes, the folding clothes, the how to manage money, the tithing and the offering and the missions, and, and all of these things that we teach our young people to do today would not matter much if we were not praying and teaching our children to have a loyal heart toward God. We 
can prepare youth in every aspect of life. We can pair our, prepare our youth uh, for careers today. Uh, we can prepare them for the family today. We can prepare them to drive on the road today. We can prepare them uh, in athletics. We can prepare them all of these things in our life today. But I trust today that if we are not preparing them to excel in all manners of life, if we're not doing so with the idea of being loyal to God, I believe in a great way we're failing our children. So I want to speak to you on the topic this morning of loyalty. Of loyalty. And I want you to understand that not only are we to prepare our youth for such avenues of life as far as a career and intending to business and managing of money and all of these things in family matters, each and every one of us should strive in our life to become better in being loyal to God. There's too many in this life that have settled. In this life, they've settled to become the Christian of status quo. The Christian that mainstream society believes that they should be. Too often, many times, people begin to compare themselves with other people or churches with other churches and Christians with other Christians. And, and little Johnny and little Julie will say, well, hey, listen, uh, I'm not as bad as that person over there. Man, I'm doing better than they are. And that's all fine and true. It is against the Word of God to do those things. We ought not do them. But the reality is this, is the Lord Jesus Christ isn't going to compare you to your counterparts. He's not going to compare you to how your, your, uh, your housemate or how your workmate, how they're living their life for Christ. He's going to compare you to the Son of God, amen, to the perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in our world today, in our life, this is a seemingly overlooked topic from most of the pulpits this morning. I personally believe that most men don't want to preach because they're, they're nervous that it'll rub people wrong. I know how my heart was convicted throughout this week in just studying out this simple little topic of being loyal to God. Not lo hey, listen, loyal to God. Amen. It makes me wonder why we hear so much, so little about loyalty in today's world, in 2016. The word loyal, the word loyal is defined as an unswerving, is unswerving an allegiance towards something or someone. Unswerving. Now, if I, was to, if I was to ask you who you thought of right then from the Bible, when you hear that word unswerving, who do you think of? I think of an eight-year-old boy who became king by the name of Josiah. We touched on in the book of Daniel here the past couple of weeks during our morning Bible study on Wednesday. The Bible says he, he, he went to the left hand nor to the right hand, but walked straight past. You know, if you get that idea in your mind this morning of what an eight-year-old child as a king walked the right way, walked the straight path, walked the, walked the way that God wanted him to walk despite what his friends were doing, despite what his counterparts were doing, despite what may have been popular. Hey, as a matter of fact, paganism was the reigning thing in Judah at that time. My soul, the temple had been taken over by sodomites. It had been taken over by pagan worshipers. It had a grove built inside of the temple. They had idols set up in the temple. The very temple that David is praying over the provisions of right here, asking God to bless his precious son to be able to build that palace, but to keep the testimonies, to keep the statutes, and to keep the commandments of God. Amen. The very thing that he's praying, this prayer of loyalty of his son. By the time Josiah was made king at eight years old, that place was nothing more than a pantheon of pagan false gods. The Bible says that little eight-year-old boy went to the left hand or the right hand, walked straight path. He was loyal, my friend, unswerving in allegiance towards something or someone. You know, we find shining examples in today's world of what loyalty is. We find it in our marriages. We find it in our friendships. We find it in employment. We even find it in certain clubs and organizations. I know people today that have been more loyal to the Masonic Lodge than they have to the house of God. I know someone in particular who left the Masonic Lodge and did it, I mean, perfectly like you wouldn't imagine. You said, oh, preacher, you never can leave. Well, he left. He wrote one letter. One quarter, wrote another letter in the second quarter, wrote another letter in the third quarter, uh, because he said if he did not, someone would pay his dues and he would still be linked in there. He did it the right way. 
He did it, he did it completely the right way. That I got to burn all the stuff on a fire. It's happy for me. Amen. <laughs> However, when he left the church, his didn't show up for months on end. It makes me wonder why. I'm going to tell you why. We see in our world today, even though we see loyalty in our marriages, we see loyalty in our friendships, we see loyalty in employment and loyalty in certain organizations, we don't hear about the loyalty to God. I'm afraid in our world today, and guys, this is a positive message, even though it doesn't sound like it so far. <laughs> it really is, I'm going to tell you. One of the reasons is I think in our mind, Back here, we just say God's always going to be there because God's always has. God's just always going to be there. <laughs> loyalty. True loyalty is unswerving in allegiance towards something or someone. Now, guys, I understand. I say we've had, we see loyalty in marriages and friendships and employment clubs. We also see the antithesis of loyalty exemplified in those same things. So don't, don't, don't misunderstand that I'm saying that everyone is loyal in those, those things. But loyalty comes from the heart. Loyalty does not seek an alternative motive. It is rather true. So loyalty is single-hearted in servitude. Loyalty to God is single-hearted in sureness. When loyalty from the Lord is developed, do you know what you're going to find? You're going to find attitudes, actions, and attributes of people in society, and in society and in the church, begin to change. I, I love the story of the potter and the clay. That the potter was making it, and then he didn't like what he looked at. Then he, he has the power. The potter has power over the clay. God is the potter, and we're the clay. When we are loyal to the Lord Himself. Not loyal to a creed, not loyal to a name, not loyal to, but loyal to the Lord Himself. Our attitudes, our actions, and our attributes will begin to change. People will begin to consider their actions by thinking how they will re react first in their life. People will consider their attitudes by thinking about what they will reflect first in their life. People will consider their attributes by thinking how what they will resonate first in their life. Proverbs 29 verse 11 says, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it till afterwards. When we talk about actions and attitudes and attributes, when we speak of, of reacting and reflecting and resonating in society today, the Word of God and the loyalty to God, when we speak on those things, this is what we're talking about. Uh, that a fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it till afterwards. Think about it. Those who give people a piece of their mind quickly and abruptly, they're not considering loyalty to the Lord. Someone who leads a life loyal to the Lord considers these things and how it will affect those around them. How can our words, guys, how can our life, how can our demeanor even affect others? I mentioned last week in one of the services that, uh, that smiles are contagious. And, and I've often uh, you know, walked the streets here in Abraham and just on my own many a time just to see how many smiles I can get out of people. Now, guys, I don't have a natural-looking smile. Never have, amen. Some people just got a natural, beautiful smile. I love my wife's smile. I think she's got one of the best smiles in all the world. She goes, oh, but you see all my teeth. I say, I like to see your teeth. They're beautiful. Amen. She's got a great smile. I don't, but I do it anyway. I walk the streets just to see, just to say, good morning, how are you doing today? And it is amazing how often, many times, People speak to you when you speak to them. People, people live lives today and they're like, well, nobody talks to me. Well, would you talk to them? Amen? It's a two-way street, guys. Well, I'm speaking on the terms, and it may seem awkward right now. I'm speaking on the terms of being loyal to God. How can our life, our demeanor, our actions affect others? And I'm going to tell you this morning, it affects them in a great way. There are groups in this world today who believe that their actions can be determined by their opinions. I was speaking the other day to a couple people under this same topic. So many will use, use Jude 23 
as an excuse to basically punch someone in the mouth with the scriptures or their personal ideologies. You're reading it from up top. It says, and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. I understand the verse, guys. And by the way, I was one of those guys that was saved by fear. I was saved out of the fear of spending an entire eternity in a devil's hell and burning for all eternity. That was me. But Pastor Jim Ellis did not reach across his desk and smack me in the mouth with the Word of God. He didn't, he didn't reach over to me and say, Bless God, the wicked are going to be cast into a devil's fire. He didn't do that. He witnessed to me the precious gospel of Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work. You see, the, the ones that, that use this excuse to go out and ridicule and bash people with the Word of God, they use the same verse. But the odd thing is this, is that they overlook the context of the very Scripture they're using. Look, in, look him up top here at Jude 20. Remember I told you guys, if there, if there is no context, it's either pretext or subtext in the Holy Scripture. Jude 20 says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Watch this. Keep yourself in the love of God, not the hatred of God. Looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Guys, can I say this to you this morning? And we're going to get into the, the outline here shortly. Making a difference in the lives of others is practiced by having compassion. You know what the word compassion means? Passion, we understand the word means struggle. It means pain. It means torture. It means, it means a, a great conflict. Come means to enter into that conflict, that struggle, that pain, that abuse, with them. With them. That's what having compassion on someone means. Think on this. That rich young ruler came to the Lord Jesus Christ. He came running unto Him. He fell on His knees. He said, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Right? The Lord told him what to do. The guy was broken hearted because he had much riches. Oh, and he said, hey, look, I've done all those things. Yeah, but one thing thou lackest. Just before Christ said, one thing thou lackest. The Bible says that Christ moved. Christ had compassion on him. Do you know what Jesus Christ did? He drew alongside him in the fact of where he was where he was in his life, and he was on his way to hell. Jesus Christ empathized with him. Jesus Christ grabbed a hold of him and stood where he was standing. He says, yeah, but there's one thing thou lackest. Sell all thy hands. Give to the poor. And now I shall inherit to my life. Now, it wasn't a works-based religion Christ was telling him. He knew that the boy was wealthy, and he knew that his money became his master. His money was his God. And by that, that, that thought alone, he knew that it was between him and salvation. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? If we're going to have compassion on someone, guys, we're going to have to stop and think where they are. Is it a struggle? Is it hard? Absolutely. Uh, will our flesh and our life uh, in the Christian world, will we step back and say, yeah, but they need to be doing this. I understand that. But if we're going to be loyal to Christ and exemplify His life in this world, beloved, it's going to start by us practicing to have compassion on others. But see, having compassion on others is performed by loyalty. By loyally praising Christ above and beyond our own personal feelings, our own personal pet peeves. That, that's what it is. I preached the message years and years and years ago, titled Getting Past the Past. And one of the topics inside of that sermon was this one right here. Get, getting, if you're going to get past the past, you've got to get over yourself. If you're going to let go of what used to be, should have been, could have been, you've got to let it go, man. You've got to get over yourself, amen? Because we can all sit back in misery and waller and say, oh, I wish I'd have done this. Well, you didn't, and it's done and over with. Let's move on, amen? So let's be loyal to the Lord. 
Loyalty to God is, is practiced by having compassion. Compassion is performed by loyally praising Christ above me on our own personal feelings. All of which is pursued by, listen to the verse, keeping ourselves in the love of God. Keeping ourselves in the love of God. And looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Beloved, there's a dual application in looking to the Lord's mercy. I promise I'm going to get to the outline by God's grace this morning. But there is a dual application in that book of Jude of looking for the Lord's mercy. Number one, we are looking for Him to come back soon. Very soon. As we see this world moving in the direction that's moving in our lifetimes today, we are looking for God's mercy upon His bride, upon His people to come and take us back to Him. But two, the mercy of the Lord is what cleansed us from all of our sins. Cleansed us. Every wrongdoing, every time we jump to conclusions, every time we have our, our loyalty to the Lord, every time our loyalty to the Lord has, has, just, has just been taken away and we return to Him, we're looking for mercy. Thankful that our Savior has cleansed us and not just covered it up and pulled the rug up and said, yeah, look what you did. Making a difference is practiced by compassion. Having compassion by performing, loyally praising Christ. That is loyalty. Loving God as He loved us. This is what enables us to love others. This is what enables us to love those that are unlovable at times because, because this is what enabled others to love us when we were unlovable. So let me say this to you this morning first and foremost. Loyalty begins with integrity. Begins with integrity. In the 19th verse of our opening text in 1 Chronicles 29, David prays this unto God concerning his son. And he says, And given to Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep, he says, to keep thy commandments, thy, thy testimonies, and thy statutes. Now let me stop you there for just a second. Before you venture off way down into Solomon's life and say, yeah, well, he had 700 concubines and yeah, he worshiped other gods. Stop it. Let me just say that. He's a child while David's praying this and this is David's prayer. So don't rob yourself of the needed blessing this morning by going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, okay, don't do that. Take the verse for what it is, guys, and I promise you this morning you'll get a benefit from it that there's beyond what you can imagine. Nothing that I can give you but what it can give you. Don't look at what happened at the end of his days. Remember, he was the wisest man on the earth who ever lived. Ever lived. Past, present, and future. David prayed that that boy have a perfect heart to keep the commandments of God, to keep his testimony, to keep his statutes, to do all of those things and to build that house. The perfect heart, guys. We're speaking of loyalty to God starts with integrity this morning. The perfect heart is a complete and mature heart, not a sinless, perfected heart, but a mature and a pure heart. The mature heart will keep the commandments of God. The mature heart will keep the testimonies of God. The mature heart will keep the statutes of God. One of which, my friend, one of which starts with honesty. Paul said in Colossians 3.9, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Guys, you know what one of the deeds of the old man was? He lied. The old man lies. Amen? The old man is just a flat liar and he ain't worth two cents. That's horrible grammar, I understand. Forgive me. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, the old man is dirty. The old man is a liar. Paul says, lie not one to another, seeing that she put off the old man with his deeds. When is the last time Someone told you something. And you knew without a shadow of a doubt that it was the gospel truth. Guys, you know what people, people have desensitized themselves today. They have desensitized themselves to a lie. They have. Guys, we see it in politics all the absolute time. What we have done is we have allowed politicians to make all these promises in the front end and to uphold absolutely none of them. And we say, well, okay, let's put them back in office. We've allowed that, that stuff to trickle down into our lives. 
People have no quorums today in telling a false truth. People have no quorums today in allowing a little bit of an exaggeration to occur. I mean, listen, I understand there's some things that can occur out of just sheer forgetfulness. I have that. That's Hey, having the inability to recall something verbatim or perfectly is not a lie. It just means you don't remember exactly the way it was. That's not a lie. That's different. Loyalty to the Lord, to the Lord involves honesty. Keeping the commandment of God. Keeping His testimonies. Keeping the statutes of God. Just imagine this. If we tell people not the truth about certain things, and I mean little things, little things, how are they going to believe us about the big things? He that is faithful in the little things shall be faithful in the, in the great things. Did not Jesus Christ say that? But he also said, he that is unfaithful in the little things will be unfaithful in the great things. Right? Dad and I was talking on the phone the other night. Uh, maybe it was last night, I think it was. No, I don't think it was last night, night before. And we were talking about this very subject. Just because, I mean, like I said, it's been on my heart. And uh, he was telling a story about a guy that was a preacher, or just got saved, was a Christian or whatever. And his son had just turned 12 two days before. And they went to a restaurant or a fair or something. I don't know where they went. But they went to this place to where that, that part, that, if he was 11 years old, they got half off. Okay, it was half price or it was a reduced price for 11-year-olds. But now that he's 12, it was the full price. And the waiter said, who, you know, I think it was a waiter, Said, hey, uh, you know, how, how, old, how old is he? Is he, is he under 12? Uh, 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 well, yeah, he, yeah, he's under 12. And he said, well, it, it was just two days before. It was just two days before. Now, let me ask you a question. It didn't matter to that waiter, that clerk, whoever it was that, in the story. It didn't matter to him. In reality, he probably could have cared less. And in reality, and most of the times, other people could care less. But God cares. You see, even at the times where you say, well, it's not going to hurt anyone. Our honesty, our integrity is an attribute of being loyal to God. Not stretching something, not telling a false story. That's why I've told you time and time again with me. With the type of memory that the Lord has blessed me with having, sometimes it is a curse because you lose faith in people. You can sit there and hear them tell the same story three or four times in a day's time and it changes every time they tell the story or the numbers change. Honesty, my friend. Boy, I thought this was a whole lot more positive than it sounds. One of these things is honesty. Secondly, we find integrity one of the ingredients in integrity is humility. Well, Peter speaks of being clothed with humility. He says that God resisted the proud and gave grace to the humble. The perfect heart that David was praying for Solomon to have was one that was a humble heart as well. Guys, listen to Lucifer, the second most powerful being in all of, the cre all of creation. He fell because of his pride. He fell because his beauty lifted him up. He fell because he said, man, look how great I am. I'm going to be like the most high. No, you're not. Bye-bye. Humility. Honesty and humility is the ingredients of integrity. The thirdly, loyalty in the mature heart. Loyalty in having integrity, keeping the testimonies of God is honor. Not only should we honor God, my friend, in all that we do, say, and give and go, but we should honor one another. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, he said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That word esteem means to respect or admire, to hold higher than another. And in this case, in the Holy Scripture, we are to hold others higher than ourselves. We are to consider them more than we consider ourselves. Honoring one another with an honest and with a humble mind, honest and a humble heart. When we place others, others' feelings first, our jesting, our quick rebuttals, our arguments, they will begin to subside. When we put other people first in our life, maybe consider where they are. Look into the path that they are trying to tread. Try to place ourselves in their shoes before striking them down. 
Loyalty begins with integrity. Loyalty begins, my friend, with integrity. What I desire in my own life is if I say something, I want somebody to believe it. You say, well, well why is that so important? Because the greatest things and the greatest gift in this entire life only comes by faith. Faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And people are only going to hear it either by reading the Holy Scriptures, by receiving a gospel tract from someone hopefully that they trust, or by word of mouth. More people are going to hear it by word of mouth than they ever are reading on their own the scriptures or receiving the track. That's why we always say that missions is the heartbeat of God, but it's in our hands. And whenever, every time the word mission is heard, we think of global missions. My friend, missions start right here. Acts 1 8 talks about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the pattern it took. It started at home, it went out the outskirts of the region, it went throughout the country, and then it went through the uttermost parts of the world. And that's every single local church's and every single Christian's responsibility. You may financially not be able to support missions, then you pray for those missionaries on the field. But we can witness and we can pray for those in our Jerusalem right here, right now. The Lord is not asking you to walk 30 miles a week. He just asks you to take care of those that are in your sphere of influence, in your little circle. So you want to be able to be believed. Beloved, if you can't be believed on your bills, if you can't be believed on... Uh, on other things, if you can't be believed or trusted or dependent on, if you can't be believed, when you start telling somebody about the precious gift of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not going to believe you. They're not going to. I, I know, I know, you know, we're like, oh, well, bless God, we don't want people following a man. Start studying your scriptures out just a little bit more before we make that statement. Paul said, you were followers of us and the Lord. Be ye followers of me as I follow Christ. Guys, listen, if he, if he had no integrity in his life, if he was not loyal to the Lord, he could not have said those things. If he was not loyal to God, if his heart was not there and communing with God and he wasn't able to be trusted or dependent on, guys, listen, here's the deal. They could not have said, okay, I'll follow you. So let me say this first this morning. I'm going to run, I'm going to die. Loyalty begins with integrity. But it's followed by intensity. Look in verse 19 again, the, the second part. It says, and to do all these things and to build the palace. Now, that's a teeny little word, do. But I like it. I just like it. I like when Paul wrote, and he says, those things you've seen and heard in me and among many witnesses, the next word is do. It's not a long, drawn-out sentence. It's not a, it's not a highfalutin word. Just do it. Nike had one of the best promotional advertisements in the 1980s that is still to this day going on. Just do it. Everybody says that. They know it. They think of Nike. It was one of the greatest things in the world to ever uh, come out in the marketing realm. Because anytime somebody heard do it or do right, they thought of Nike. Ma mastermind in advertising. And all they, did, all they did was copy it from the Bible. Do. Do that. David prays and he says to do all the things, all these things and to build the palace. Integrity is the central ingredient needed for loyalty and from integrity, an intensity to serve and seek in the Lord grows in leaps and bounds. The intensity level of our loyalty begins to mold and to make our heart meet for the Master's use. Our devotion, our dedication, all of those things makes Him bigger and brighter in our life than ever before and therefore we reflect those things. We reflect them unto others. We've got to be intense about it. Which starts with integrity. It starts with how we present ourselves. It starts with how we say and what we do. Guys, it moves on to our life with intensity. So loyalty begins with integrity. It's followed by intensity. But guys, it's supported thoroughly and finally. Individually. In, in, the, in verse 19, the latter part, it says, For the which I have made provision. 
David, the father of Solomon, made provisions for the palace of God, the temple to be built. He did all of these things, but God was not going to allow him to do it, for he was a man of war. Though they were still worshiping God, they were still coming to the same tabernacle that they did in the wilderness. Up until that time, David's heart was rent. David's heart was torn apart because he wanted God to have his own house. He wanted to be able to master peace for God. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially in the Old Testament times. God said, you're not going to do it. Solomon, your son, is going to be a man of peace. You're a man of war. You've got blood on your hands. But I'm going to be free. I'm going to bring peace into this time. And Solomon's going to build that temple. So David's prayer this day, David's prayer before the congregation, David's plea unto God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, uh, and our fathers, he says, is for his son, my friend, to continue on for what he made provisions of. And even though David prayed, and even though he proclaimed these things, and this work would transpire, it would be Solomon that build that magnificent work. It would be through his leadership individually. It would be through Solomon's ministry to this venture to take place. It would be Solomon's legacy that built this magnificent temple. But it would be through his loyalty that the Lord's temple would be blessed and would be known. So, beloved, we're all given a responsibility. I can make all the provisions for my children. For that, may, for that case, as a pastor, I can make all the provisions for you that I can. I can preach until I'm blue in the face. One of the old sayings in the States, I can preach until the cows come home. I don't know if you guys understand that one. I don't know if sheep come home like cows do. But I can preach until the cows come home. But at the end of the day, it's an individual responsibility to be loyal to God. It's an individual responsibility to have integrity in your life. It's, it, it's an individual responsibility to have that intensity and ramp it up a little bit. We are responsible for our loyalty to the Lord. We must give an account for what we have done in the body of Christ. Our works will go on before us unto heaven where we will stand uh, in all, yet also stand in judgment of what we've done and built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Beloved, it starts by how loyal we are to Him today. Right here, right now. All of the provisions can be made. We've taught our children to do right, walk right, think right. We've taught them to do all those things. But one day they've got to do it themselves. It's a loyalty unto the Lord. But it's a loyalty that starts with love. And it's not that we loved Him first. We love Him today. Because He first loved us. Let that love of Christ, where He loved you, be seen in our loyalty to Him. Amen? Can you buy your hands your Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done. We ask you now, please, just bless the close of this service. Father, I pray that we switch off not so quickly. Lord, we're looking forward to a good time of fellowship this afternoon. My prayer, my heart's desire, is that you would take that precious word that was heard this morning, this morning on the topic of loyalty. And that you would so richly and wonderfully, tremendously use it in the lives of everyone present. Everyone that will hear and see this message. Father, I pray that the next week when temptations come, that we would think on these things and that we would do them. To the praise and glory and honor goes to our living live Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning, whose name we ask all of these things. Amen and amen.